All right, it's the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me begin by welcoming everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief uh, host and chief cat herder, and I'm very glad to see you all here today. We have a fantastic guest for a terrific subject, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But before we begin that, let me just start by introducing the forum, explaining how it works, where it comes from, where it's headed, and then we'll introduce this week's guests. So to begin with, you should know that the forum is a discussion-based space. This is not a traditional webinar. It's not a presentation venue. Instead, this is all about conversations, the exchange of questions, reflections, ideas, pushback, and affirmation. And that's what the overwhelming majority of this hour is about. And we've been doing this for quite some time. In fact, we are now in our fifth year, which is enormously exciting. Now, the forum is part of my broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. Now, this is an attempt to try to grapple with the future of higher education as we know it. It's multimedia, multimodal, it's open, and includes a great number of projects. It includes the forum, which occurs every week. It also includes a monthly trends analysis called the FTTE Report. It includes a blog. It includes a book club and includes some more stuff beyond that. So if you're new to it, just head to futureofeducation.us to learn more. Now we can only do this work, which is open and free, with the help of some generous supporters. And I want to thank them before we go further. To begin with, I want to thank NYSERNet in New York State. That's a nonprofit that helps that state's come. Uh, colleges and universities do wonderful things online using broadband internet and professional development. We're delighted their work and delighted they can support us. We're also grateful to Shindig for making available the technology we're using right now. So before we go further, let me introduce to you the technology and how it works with an emphasis on how it affords our participation. Where I am right now, and where this slide is, just for a minute, is called the stage. And we call it that because everyone can see and hear everything that takes place on the stage. Think of it as the stage or proscenium in a theater or a lecture hall. Now, right below us, you can see around you maybe a dozen or two dozen individual squares. Each one of those represents one sign-in from somewhere in the earth. Typically, it's one individual person. Sometimes it's two or more around a single computer. And if you look closely, each one will either be a, a live video feed, like you can see Jessica Sardin, or it's a photo, um, say, of Kate Herzog. And each of those is a person or persons that you can connect with. So during the hour, if you'd like to talk with them, just double click on their icon. And if they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Legos. You can have your own private audiovisual bubble, which is pretty neat. Now, how do you participate in the broader conversation? There are two main ways. Look at the bottom of the screen. You should see a few different buttons lined up there. One of the buttons is a question mark. And another one of the buttons is a raised hand. If you click on the question mark, up pops a little box into which you can type in a question or a comment. And I will read those on the screen out loud so everyone can hear them. And I'll flash them on the screen so everyone can see them. Now, that's a good way to share a question if you don't have a camera that works. Now, if you do have a video camera that works, part of your laptop or your phone, and you're in a place like I am right now where you can speak freely out loud, press the raised hand button. That tells us you want to join us up here on stage. And when the time is right, I'll beam you up on stage. It really just takes two presses of two buttons from me. And you'll be able to ask us questions face to face. In fact, up here, we can hold up to four people at a time. So there can be the guest, there can be me, and two of you for a kind of pop up panel. And that's kind of the maximum benefit of video conferencing technology. So those are the two of the ways you can communicate with us on Shindig. And we're really grateful to the company for letting us use the technology. We're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. Uh, if you don't know Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site like GoFundMe or Kickstarter. It lets people collaboratively kick in money in order to keep a project going. In this case, it's our project of exploring the future of the, of the university. Uh, people contribute as little as a dollar a month to make sure that all the machines are on, all the lights are glowing. Um, some people contribute as much as $10 or more, and I want to thank them here. We have more than 100 sponsors, but these are the top ones. Folks like Matthew Trainum, Chris Johnson, Paul Henley, Erwin DeVries, Jeannie Kimahan, Corey S., Lisa Pritchard, Colleen Carmine, Laura Armour. We're really grateful to them for their support, and you can join them. 
Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. So that's who supports our program. That's how our program works. Now let me get to this week's guest. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have Sabrina Manville here today. Um, there's a backstory to this I want to bring up. Um, Sabrina works with, she's one of the co-founders and leaders of Edmit, which is a Boston-based consultancy. Last year, they produced what I call the most dangerous report in the higher education, the single most terrifying document produced in American academia. It was an analysis of the financial health of colleges and universities. They built up a model and applied it in the real world to a bunch of colleges and universities, which then turned around and asked them in legal language to not publish that report. It's quite a story. Uh, with a lot of implications for how we do higher education operations and strategy. Um, I'm delighted that we can have Sabrina here uh, to talk to us about the report. And as we go, I'd really like to hear your questions, your comments. So to begin with, welcome, Sabrina. Thank you so much, Brian. It's great to be here. And I, it's fun to see everyone's floating visions. Um, I'm excited to hear from all of you and, and hear your questions. Well, thank you for saying that. It's great that you could make it. Um, I'm a big fan, and uh, oh gosh, I have so many questions. But let me start off. I introduced you very, very quickly, but I prefer to have people introduce themselves. And here's the question that you can answer in order to explain yourself to people. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the projects and topics that are top of mind for you for the rest of 2020? Great question. So, um, so my company, Admit, our mission is to help families make good financial decisions about college. Mm -hmm. And that includes a lot of things. It includes how to find colleges that are affordable to them, um, how to figure out what size student loan is the right size, mm -hmm. how to think about what to major in, um, what they're going to do after college, basically pulling everything together uh, so that families are better off after college is the term that we use because we, as we know, there's a lot of, um, there's kind of uh, a lot of different outcomes that families are seeing now with respect to um, the cost of college and um, student loans particularly. So Admit has software and a variety of tools that um, students and families use as they're evaluating where to go. And as we, I guess that's our mission and we're gonna be working through a lot of, you know, always working to improve the advice that we give families. And that's kind of our, that's always our goal. <laughs> so that's what I'll be working on in the next year. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, that's a, that's, that whole goal is something which we badly need right now in 2020, uh, especially in work in higher education. I'm not just saying that as a father with the youngest child yeah. now at university. Um, okay. yes. I'm so glad you know. work. Yeah. Uh, so let, let me ask, uh, some people couldn't make it today because they had conflicts and they gave me some questions to share um, okay. right away. And one of them I wanted, uh, wanted to share was um, for this, what I call the most dangerous report in higher education, what was, what was your strategy behind this? Uh, I, I can see it fitting into Edmund's mission of trying to better fit individual students and families with the best institutions. Um, but tell us more about your thinking. What was the what was the plan? What was your uh, philosophy? Yeah. So this really started as an internal research question. Um, um, as I've said, we we focused on financial aid and how it works, student loans, yeah. salary data. Um, but we started to get some questions from families, and we're based in Boston, so you know there have been several high profile college closures in New England in the past few years. And we started to hear from our customers asking whether this is, whether the financial health of colleges was something that they should be considering as part of their um, college search. And it was a very fair question, but we didn't have an answer to it. And um, mm -hmm. that caused us to say, well, let's do some work here and see if there's something that we can glean and some something that we can incorporate into our advice. So it really started as, as an internal research project. Um, I think many of the people on the call probably read uh, the article that summarized the methodology. Um, but essentially, we dug into data uh, from iPads and also 990 forms and looked at what are the biggest correlations um, 
with uh, basically revenue and expenses and whether a college will have um, money to fund its operations you know, going forward. And when we did this analysis, we came out with um, a statistical model that used you know, the data that we have historically to project into the future, uh, when would a college's um, revenues, or when would a college's expenses basically outpace its growth in revenue? Mm -hmm. and, and the point at which it did not have any additional um, unrestricted assets to fund its operations. So pretty simple stuff. Uh, but we 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 could see, you know, what's the lifespan of a college if nothing changes, right? If the trends continue, um, when when is there trouble from uh, like a financial cash perspective? And our plan was to actually publish this as a data set uh, and and a model on GitHub. Um, so we knew. At, at right away that this wasn't something that would immediately go into the hands of families. Um, mm -hmm. Because as, and I think this is a really kind of useful conversation that we can have, like how do you present that data in a way that has enough context behind it um, so that you're not, you know, turning people away from a college that, that could be a good fit for them and could be, you know, st stable. <laughs> and so we, we wanted to really kind of, open up the conversation with other researchers, have people, you know, look at our data, contribute to it, suggest um, improvements to it, and kind of have like a living, breathing uh, a research project in the community because what, what we found was a lot of the work that's been done in this area is happening behind closed doors. And there's been always a lot of resistance to sharing it with anyone that's not kind of in in that room, um, including people like us. And so uh, our hope was to have something a little more open start to happen. And then obviously uh, that was very threatening um, to uh, you know, some, some players in the space. And given that this isn't our core business as a company, uh, we're a small company, we uh, kind of chose to uh, not publish the data just just to, to not, <laughs> just to avoid um, potential, you know, protracted legal battles. And uh, so right now we're kind of working on a few other ways to um, collaborate on, on this problem. Does anyone else, do you all see me? Cause I see black on Brian's screen, but maybe we're in. Sabrina, can you see me now? Okay. Can you see me now, Sabrina? Yes, you're back. Very good. Very good. Um, th what a story! Oh my gosh. Um, I, I I have a bunch of questions. Um, but friends, let me just quickly ask a couple of clarifying questions, and then I would love to hear your thoughts so you can jump on in. Um, uh, one thing you mentioned that that flabbergasted me is that you said as you were doing this work, you couldn't find this information elsewhere. I mean, nobody else had done this. Nobody else had published models of college universities' financial viability that you could use in your research? Well, so yeah, there have been other examples. So um, the federal government has a college financial health score. Right. Um, the, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to translate that into something that's meaningful for the uh, consumer because there's flags that don't really tell you much like a you know for example does a college did a college finish its audit on time you know like that doesn't really tell you about the um the longer term financial stability of the college uh forbes magazine has uh, financial health rankings which have a much more complex methodology um and give a letter grade to colleges they had stopped doing it actually and then um when this all happened they quickly kind of re-upped their model and, and published a new version of it in, I believe, December. So that's available publicly online. Um, and I've pointed people to that kind of in the interim because I think, uh, you know, it's probably, it, it, it actually seems to have fairly good correlation with our findings. Um, so there are some other initiatives that have happened. I think the more, um, the more nuanced and robust research is, 
is what's either in the hands of kind of academic oh. researchers or um, you know behind the in the accrediting bodies of government that and there's a lot of um, there's they, those entities are preventing it from being shared. Wow. wow. I mean, so you really, you really changed the, uh, the uh, conversation. Um, it, I, I'm, I've got a Forbes page up here called the uh, Forbes 2019 college financial health grades. How fit is your school? Yes. That's cool? Yeah. Okay. okay. Let me just put that out there. So you've just single handedly, even, even without publishing as you planned on doing so, um, you've changed the uh, you've changed the landscape. You you've helped bring Forbes back to the table, and uh, and you've provoked a whole series of conversations. Yeah, I think that's um, well. Thank you. I that I, I I agree. I mean, I think we felt the conversation was a good one, um, even if we couldn't reveal our report. <laughs> um, and I think that. As we've seen, I think Brian, we we had chatted about this. Like our, the Massachusetts uh, Massachusetts is doing um, a new initiative to really evaluate the viability of colleges in this state, and I think as a result of a lot of these um, kind of publications, there's probably going to be increased pressure to at least share some of that externally with students and families and and the broader public. Do you find uh, one one follow-up uh, question to that? Um, well, this is a practical question, a very pragmatic one, and if you don't want to answer it, you don't you don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, are is all the legal kerfluffle? Are all the threats? Is that done with, or are are others still leaning on you about this? No. So, well, the the main concern was about having the that uh, that predictive model yeah. publicly available. Yes. Since it's not, they they all ceased fire. Yes. Well, good for you. Um, uh, and good for Edmund. Um, uh, friends, let, let me open the floor. Um, you must have tons of questions. You might want to wonder about the model itself, how it works. You might wonder about their data. You might wonder more about this story, this saga um, that's still yeah. unfolding. Um, please, if you want, either click the uh, raised hand icon and I can beam you up on stage as easy as can be. Or if you want to type in a question or a comment, just hit the question mark, and type in it, and I'll, I'll put it up. And before I can even finish that sentence, uh, a couple of hands have just gone up. So um, um, please uh, uh, type away and, uh, and join us uh, if you like. Um, well, while people are doing that, um, I do see some chats. Oh, great. Oh, great. Well, let's respond to one of the chat questions. Well, so Lisa asks, so why is this report so dangerous? which I think is a very fair <laughs> question. Um, so because the Forbes thing exists and Forbes didn't get, you know, um, Dude. scared out of publishing it. Um, I think the one thing I um, can see was different is that we did predict that years to close. So mm. we had, there was, um, there was a more uh, concrete kind of output of it than just a financial grade. And I think obviously that's, um, it's a little bit of a riskier thing to do to say, you know, you've got 10 years to live. Um, mm. But I think that was the way that we felt we could make it meaningful to a student uh, who was looking at this. Same, the same way that the federal government flag doesn't have that context, like what do I do with that information, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's why it was, perceived as more dangerous. Um, Zachary's question, are colleges not legally liable to the students? No. And so I think we were really coming at this from the perspective of how do we advise um, a student? And I think that's really woefully overlooked in this conversation because the fact is that even if the, first of all, if the college closes while you're there, we've seen plenty of examples recently. Um, yeah you know, transfer credits don't happen. Um, you might be shifted to a college that doesn't have your desired major, that's farther away. Um, so there's real financial costs. You may, you may be less likely to graduate because there's a big interruption in your studies. And so there really are real financial costs to a student um, and, you know, their family, if, if the family is contributing. On the other, oh. I Oh, please go ahead if you found one. Um, so the other the other side, though, is 
if a college is not doing well, even if it's, you know, only a few years. So, so even if the few years from closing, right, um, that's going to impact the student experience as well. And I think if you think about from the perspective of um, advising a family member, which which I've done recently, that would be my concern for advising a family member of of going to a small private college, you know, that might have enrollment challenges, um, is that there's decreasing um, resources to support that student's growth and education. And I think families deserve to have some way to understand it. Um, I did hear just one anecdote. So uh, behind, you know, so there was all the public, you know, um, media coverage and all of that, but we we got a lot of private messages to us about the work, which were really interesting. Um, college presidents reaching out to, to say like, what's my grade or, you know, what's my score? Um, we had a couple people ask if we could present to their like finance committee. Sure. Um, and I did, I got one chat, which I was very um, moving to me, which was a, someone who had just recently quit his job at a private college in Pennsylvania um, because he just felt like the college was not in good health and he couldn't keep working. He, he hated that they were kind of lying to students and families, as he put it, and trying to get people to come when wow. behind the scenes, like he knew that there wasn't the re there weren't the resources to support them and things were kind of falling apart. So again, we can question like how widespread that particular situation is and how many students that would touch. But um, I do think, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversations happening on campuses about this, which I'm sure many of you um, are part of or would, would like to weigh in on. Well, this sounds almost underground now. Um, <laughs> we have a, a, a couple of uh, uh, questions that have just come in. Uh, and let me bring up one from uh, Amanda Burbage, who's a video question. So let me put her on stage. Um, hi, Amanda. Hi, everybody. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah, good to be here. Um, I'm really interested in this uh, topic. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm just kind of observing two things, and I love your input. Um, one is where is where's the intersection with uh, like the First Amendment and free speech? I mean, you have a right to um, you know convey your intellectual property and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think my response, my response to both is actually kind of connected, which is that I think the fear, the expressed fear is that if you get um, a bad financial health grade, it'll accelerate the demise of your institution because, you know, students will not come. Um, and so I think, so in that sense, there could be kind of damages claimed, right? Because um, there's a loss of enrollment that could be in theory, tracked to this um, report. So that's why it's a little bit, um, and I'm not a lawyer, so I probably shouldn't opine on this topic, but that, I think that, that, that's the theory. Um, and yes, so I, I agree with you that I, I think that it is a, it's a very, it's a particular time and place. I think that what, one thing that's interesting and I'd love to hear others' comments on this, like the um, the fact that the Forbes ranking kind of goes un undisturbed, even though uh, it is a place where students and family, like families are more likely to find it and students are more likely to find it than like in GitHub, which is where we had originally intended to put it. Um, to me implies that there's a bit of the like, the higher ed prestige game going on here where they're, you know, you're more upset about 
um, your peers in seeing it in inside higher ed than you are about a potential student seeing it on Forbes.com. But that's just, that's one observation. I thought that was interesting because because we really weren't gonna publish it in any place that a student would likely find it in the course of their college research. Uh, great question. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Um, we have um, a couple of other questions that have just come in. Uh, so let me bring up uh, Greg Schickman from the University of Central Florida. We're here. He's the Associate Vice President of Something. Hello, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hey, Brian. How are you? Sabrina, how are you? Sure. you. So um, Nathan Graw did his book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a great question. I should have mentioned it. We actually left public institutions out of this because um, because of that X factor of state funding. It, I think it would just be a different animal in in how to um, how to project it because I think there's more there are more people willing to swoop in and and save the college in the case that it isn't doing well than I think in the case of a private institution. So we really focused on privates for this, this round of research, but I agree that the issues are widespread in the public sector as well. Um, I don't know, you, what do you think <laughs> being, a, being at, a, at a public institution? Like what would be the way, and actually I should have mentioned there is a book coming out um, or it's, it's about to be out called The College Stress Test. Yep. Um, which is, uh, and maybe someone involved in that book is on this video call, but they have um, a slightly different methodology, um, but also look at public institutions and state appropriations as an input into the model. And they do not name names in their book, which I think is another difference. So they, the, um, book, is, um, the book is meant to be like, a, as I understand it, a handbook for what are the things to look at to evaluate the, the health of your institution. So, so this this is a it's a how to, not a what was done kind of book. Uh, this coming with yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, that's a really good point. Um, and we have a bunch of questions. I just wanted to mention uh, a fantastic book, um, The Great Mistake, mm -hmm. um, it's the best book I know of about public funding of higher education in the US. Um, you know, Chris is a brilliant guy. Uh, thank you for the brilliant question, Greg. Yeah, thank you. And stay warm. <laughs> we have a, a ton of questions that have come in. Let me just bring in some of the uh, text questions. Um, that are really, really interesting. This is from Robert McGuire, who says, without naming names, can you say a freshman are putting down deposits now at schools that you can predict won't be around in four to five years? 
Hi, Robert. Um, <laughs> I know, Robert. Um, good to see you. So, uh, yeah, so our, our list had um, a couple hundred institutions that were kind of within that five and 10 year range. So um, wow. certainly those colleges are enrolling students. And um, the interesting thing, and I think this is mentioned um, in the article write up, what, um, you know, for first, institutions of a certain size, um, a change in enrollment of, you know, a couple, a few dozen students here and there can be like very significant to this, to the shape of their class. So, um, and when you're tuition dependent, you won't have that cushion. So I think, you know, it is, a, it's a, it's a tricky place to be. I just, uh, I, I, I just want to repeat that thing you just said, because I just, flabbergasted me. Um, in your list, there were a couple hundred colleges and universities that might not be there in five to 10 years. If not, yeah, if nothing changes, right? Yep. I just want to make sure everyone heard that, um, especially because um, people think I'm pretty dark and depressing about higher education, but um, but that's, that's a really important takeaway. And by the way, Robert, thank you for phrasing that question uh, in just such a way that won't get us into uh, uh, more trouble necessarily. Um, uh, we have another person on video. Let me just bring up the uh, awesome uh, Michael Haggins. Uh, Michael, do we have a camera on you? I think so. There we are. Hello, sir. Yeah. Hi. Well, uh, I guess I first saw this uh, report of your dangerous report on um, what inside higher education one morning and uh, have been curious about it since uh, and really appreciate the delicate situation that you and your colleagues uh, may be in. So uh, if I ask a question that is beyond the bounds, uh, feel free not to answer. Um, it seems to me that the general question you're talking about has been known for some time. Forbes has dealt with it. Every year, Moody's issues a report that's essentially on credit worthiness. Right. So Let's talk about, if I'd, I'd ask you to talk about the other variables that are in your, uh, uh, in your model. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me how you, you don't need to tell me how they're weighted, but what are the other variables or general characteristics that you see when you scan all of the institutions? So what we found was that the factors that were most significant in predicting revenue and expenses were um, tuition and tuition discounting, the, uh, the size of uh, salaries. So kind of the, which is because that's the biggest cost bucket for any institution. So, um, you know, what's how, how much is the salary um, line item? Um, and also the return on investment of their endowment portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so there's a there's a bunch of stuff that's probably intermingled with those factors, like the size of endowment probably correlates to the uh, return of the endowment. Um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the enrollment trends and discounting, I I would assume, and I'm not the I'm not the researcher, so I'm just I'm kind of hypothesizing right. here, but I think right. enrollment size and trends would be um, kind of linked with tuition and tuition discounting. So mm -hmm. those are the key things that would just contribute to the, the cash situation. And then we looked at unrestricted net, net assets, which is basically anything the university could use to supplement a loss or to, you know. To sell. Right. Right. I'd, uh, talk for a moment, if you can, about the size of the uh, faculty compensation mm -hmm. and how that might have varied. Because, of course, these are basically people operations, you know, mm -hmm. 90, 87 to 92 percent of their all of their um, uh, expenses are in personnel. Right. Well, so, and I think that's basically, so that line item is basically the the biggest factor in the expenses of the institution. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And so looking at the trend in that line kind of can be used to forecast uh, trends going forward. Mm -hmm. 
Well, one final follow-up question on size. Uh, it does seem to me from some previous studies that were done, I think there was one in uh, Kentucky uh, seven or eight years ago on predictive uh, elements that had to do with the closure of colleges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, consistently in that report and others of its sort is the scale of the institution. That is how big it is mm -hmm. that, that it becomes increasingly more difficult to uh, maintain operations when one falls below a certain critical mass. Yeah. And for public institutions, that number... I say, not you, I say, is somewhere in the five to 6,000 range right now. Mm. For smaller, for private institutions, it may be 2,000. Mm. Uh, institutions that are below 1,000 are increasingly fragile. If you talk with, well, at an anecdotal level, so I haven't done the kind of analysis that you've done, but I can say at an anecdotal level, below those levels, these institutions are just incredibly fragile. Well, I think so, it just makes intuitive sense, right? Because yeah. you still need to support the the overhead and the um, the fixed costs that, don't, that aren't super scalable. Um, right. And like I was saying before, if, if you have such fragility where you know a few different like small numbers of, of changes in enrollment can really impact your entire financial outlook that's much more likely to happen at a smaller institution right okay. well thanks and, very much no yeah thank you oh these are great questions thank you and and stay warm in georgia michael you bet uh <laughs> we have um uh, friends, if you are new to the forum uh, or you haven't been here for a while, this is the kind of conversation we have. Uh, freewheeling coming from multiple points of view and uh, from all kinds of different geographical backgrounds. Uh, speaking of which, uh, with pleasure, I would like to bring on the stage a former student of mine, the awesome, awesome Mark Kozitska from Penn State. Hello, Mark. Hello. Um, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Um, and yes, uh, Brian knows that my questions can be a bit off topic a little bit, so please bear with me. Um, but one of the things I've been really um, kind of fascinated by, and this reflects on some of the work that I've done with Brian as well, Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, great question. So Edmit currently focuses on the traditional, traditional student. So we work uh, primarily with high school students and their parents most of them are dependent students, um, which I'm well aware is a uh, kind of a shrinking portion of the uh, higher ed landscape. And my previous job was at SNA too, so I'm very familiar with the audience you're discussing. And my answer is that um, I do think that even the traditional student is hyper aware right now of the this question of ROI. And I see that in the questions that we get and the kind of, um, the, the content that we have that people go visit, um, anything to do with major and career and kind of salary is very top of mind. And I think that's because when education feels very expensive, you're less willing to take risk. And um, 
so you're you you want to mitigate that risk by you know studying something where you know you'll get a good job afterwards um, and that so i do see that mindset very much uh, top of mind for people in a way that i i don't think it was um 10 years ago mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we'd love to move into um the adult learner population also to do uh, kind of non-degree certificates and things i think there's an even greater need for admit in some of those same cases. <laughs> Less data, though. Yeah, thank you. That would be awesome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, so you heard it here first that admit um, will <laughs> conquer all of higher education step by step. <laughs> More questions that are just, are just coming in left and right. So let me just bring another uh, text question, which I'll flash on the screen for you. Uh, and this is from Doyle Fristney, who asks, loss, loss of enrollment versus full access to information to ensure students making the right financial decision on student loans. Which is ethical? <laughs> I think that's a good question. I mean, I think that is, it is an ethical question, right? Because... Yeah. Um, yeah. When a college goes under, obviously the students are impacted, but then there's the faculty, there's the community. So um, one interesting thing we um, heard was we heard from a foundation who actually wanted access to the data so that they could figure out who to fund. Because for them, they believe that in their state, a lot of um, communities are served by these smaller institutions and they want to you know direct grant dollars to the ones that need more financial assistance so like i don't think that the that the bottom line is always don't go to this college i think that um i think there's a, definitely an ethical case to make for increasing support to many of them and especially because i think there's also going to be a correlation between the population that's served right so when you're trying to serve a more difficult to serve population, likely um, you're spending more to serve them. And um, and so, you know, those institutions kind of have greater challenges and probably are worth keeping around in many cases. It's a great question uh, and a great answer. And, and it actually keys off into another question that just came in. Uh, it's a brilliant question because it's from a librarian. Um, so I'm going to uh, bring this up on stage or on, on the screen, right? From Kate Herzog. How does the rise in e-learning figure into the future of small private colleges? That's a great question. I don't know the data on this. Brian, you'll probably know it better than me, but like what, what do we see in terms of, um, obviously on, online enrollment is growing, but is that trend true at the smaller private schools as well? Well, it started from a very, very low amount and small private colleges, depending on them, most of them have been very, very slow to engage. So, you know, they can, um, if you're starting from zero, one is a big step, right? Um, so I, I think they've been slower. Uh, I mean, you mentioned Southern New Hampshire University. Of course, it's a public state university, and those are the ones that have been really taking the lead. Um, I, I, oh, SNU is actually private. Oh, is it? Oh, my mistake. My mistake. Uh, so SNU is actually a small private college mm -hmm. that was yeah. able to leverage the online model. My mistake. So then that's yeah. definitely an exception. It's a common misconception. <laughs> and given the name, right? I mean, so that's, um, but that's that's an exception. Most liberal arts colleges I see are very, yeah. very tentative about this. They prefer the face to face. Um, uh, I, my, con, my my wild card here may just be that they may respond mm. to uh, the coronavirus um, either uh, if they have a high number of international students and they push more online, or uh, if it does have an outbreak in the US, then that might be a push forward. Otherwise, it's still pretty slow. Hmm. Uh, it's a fantastic question. Uh, and we have more questions that are just piling in. So let me just grab um, uh, our awesome longtime stalwart fan, Tom Hames from Texas. Tom asks a great question about this. Why isn't this getting mainstream media attention? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, inside higher ed, you know, it's pretty good. Um, it's a good question. I, we did, um, I'm trying to remember if there was anything that was more mainstream. I, 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 I assume that mainstream media would be very interested if the data itself came out. Um, not so much in the kind of hullabaloo around it. Right. Tom, do you want to say more about that? Tom, I don't know if we, we may have lost your audio. 
Um, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back and bug him in a bit. Um, but that's a good question, um, and uh, and that's a good answer. I mean, if 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 you had pre if you had published some uh, death notices, um, you know, for College X, College Y, um, then you know NPR, New York Times may have come after you. But yeah. uh, but let's you know let's so that's quite a. Did we lose Brian again? Hi. <laughs> Do you want to share your question? Sure. Um, first, let me acknowledge you, Sabrina. Uh, this is, it, while it may be perceived dangerous by some uh, lenses, it's it has the potential to be groundbreaking. Uh, my question is, has anyone approached your organization to partner and take the model to the next step so that your, your analysis can be validated and then turn to scenario planning. Mm. Because I think the narrative that comes out of your work, you have a heavy burden that you're carrying. Um, and there's a tendency for people to repeat the hype when, in fact, what I hear you saying is, if nothing changes. So what becomes available in your model, if people don't try to hide it, is for CFOs to use it as a, a relevant and effective tool to do scenario planning, much like a Monte Carlo approach in individual financial planning. Yeah. Now, th that's the responsible thing to do is don't remain static in continuing to do the things that have worked for the last 50 years. But now our challenge is to put new opportunities in place. Yeah. Has anyone approached you about that next level of modeling? Yeah, we've had some uh, some conversations about it. Um, I mean, we'd, we'd love for someone to kind of take it on as their own. Um, and we haven't found the right partner for that yet. Um, but I, I do think that that would be the next step. And we're also, you know, we're not an advisory company to colleges, but obviously that would be great if someone wanted to do it. Um, yeah, I would hope that colleges would have some of those financial models, but maybe they don't from, from what we heard. Um, I don't know what you're an executive director of, but if you'd like to chat about it afterwards. I would. I would. The Web Study Foundation is is committed to seeing higher education overcome the obstacles that they're constrained by. Uh -huh. um, and and so, yeah, worthy of more conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad to make this connection. Uh, the forum is a networking and community environment. Uh, and we're just delighted to see those kind of connections. We have another video uh, question that's just come in. Uh, let me bring up uh, Jessica Surden. And let's see if we go to. Hello, Jessica. We need your audio. Let's see if the connection works. Having. Hi. 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 Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah. No, I, I, I can't hear you right now. Um, you're, you're not muted on this end. Uh, well, if, if you can, uh, uh, go, go back to the um, um, question mark and, and type in your question. We'll bring that up. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we have a couple more questions that are just coming all over the place. Um, and this is one from um, uh, another follow-up from uh, uh, Robert McGuire. Let me put this on the screen here. This is... It seems to me that institutions closing is low risk and high impact, but programs or majors closing is widespread and therefore high risk. Is there a way for students to anticipate that? That is a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what, um, well, there actually is iPads data on this, right? So 
colleges do report the number of students graduating in a given program. Uh, so in theory, we could do kind of look at a trend line for different, for, you know, what, what majors are under enrolled, so to speak, at an institution. Uh, we did not do that, but it's a really great point, Robert, because I, I actually think to your point, that is a greater risk almost. Um, and given the increased impact on major and kind of career, that's likely something that people would be interested in. So thanks for the idea. It's a good oh, question. It's a really good one. Something I've been tracking uh, on my blog. Um, we have a, another question here from Charles Finlay. All right. And uh, Charles asks, if colleges admit more students who require more academic and counseling support, isn't that likely to be a financial drain in the resources of that college, perhaps ending in closing? Well, I'll put that back up again. Yeah. Hi, Charles. I think, um, I do think the data shows that um, kind of students entering college are less college ready, whatever that means, and um, yeah. tend to have more financial need, right? Like that's just the demographic trend. <clears throat> and I think that's a big part of, um, I, I think that's a big challenge that universities are facing that probably is under discussed. Like we, it, everyone loves to talk about administrative bloat, right? But um, I think colleges are rightly adding more services in many cases to support students and you know how so I, I totally agree and I, I think that's also the pickle that a lot of universities find themselves in where they're trying to climb the rankings and enroll kind of better students because that's what their faculty want um, but those students are harder to find more expensive to find yeah. Um, and um, yeah and so you're kind of between a rock and a hard place a little bit well not, not to come back to the uh, um uh, wild card, but uh, coronavirus may make it more difficult for American colleges and universities to import more international students. Um, ah, Jessica is back with a question that I've got here on the screen. How do you see a report like this playing into the current political landscape with nominees discussing things like free college and student debt forgiveness? Good question. I think there's a general, I mean, this is not news, but I, it, to anyone here, but that there is a general uh, growing suspicion of colleges, right? And um, unfortunately, like more suspicion of the value of higher education. So I, I do think that, um, I think people are talking about how to support colleges, but I think they're talking more about how to support students, right? Um, after graduation and with the student loan forgiveness. Yeah. And obviously free tuition isn't free uh, in a lot of ways. So how do you pay for that and support the institution so that outcomes can continue to be good or grow, get higher? I'm not really, I don't think this was a great answer to your question, but I think it's a very good one. Um, it may be that uh, the Edmit needs to um, hire Jessica to conduct a research project on it. Yes. I <laughs> would support this message. Um, we thank you, Jessica, for your persistence and thank you for your very, very deep question. Um, we have uh, uh, another question, if I go back to Kay Herzog, who again asks a great one. Um, to what extent should accrediting agencies take responsibility for this type of monitor? I mean, Edmit, you're a private company, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I think that was a big part of the um, kind of backlash, I would call it, to this is why is Edmit doing this? Like what, what ulterior motives does Edmit have? And we heard that a lot. Um, I, I do think accrediting agencies should, and I, I think some have to different extents. The Massachusetts initiative I mentioned is likely to be working through the accreditors is my understanding. Um, and so I think because those accreditation practices are kind of defined regionally by the accreditor, kind of the extent to which they go deep on the finances just varies a lot. That's my understanding. No, oh, that's a good answer. Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. Now, I mean, just altering They're also run by, like, you know, they're run by faculty and, you know, peers and colleagues, right? right. And other administrators. So I think the quest, there is a question here of, also just um, kind of who, what skill sets are present in the university and whether um, 
whether universities kind of have the people to do this type of analysis internally. And I don't know if accreditors either do. It's not, um, it's not something typically stressed in a, like a university administration job. True. True. Not yet. Yeah. Um, we had um, uh, a nice note here from um, uh, Stacy uh, Rue. He says, I'd be interested in discussing the model with you further. Thanks. Oh, great. And she's the chief okay. for EDUCAUSE. Well, my, I don't know, Brian, if you can share my email, but it's just sabrina at edmit.me. So it should be pretty easy to find me. There you go. There you go. Um, and uh, Stacy, follow up with me if you, uh, if, if you didn't get that, and I'll be glad to uh, share it again. Um, and we have another question, even though we're coming close to the end of the hour. Oh, my gosh, this is going by fast. Uh, it's from Elena O'Malley at Emerson College, a library director assistant. She says, how many colleges have closed or merged in the 10 years before the report? And was the 200 number that you identified significantly higher than that? Good That's question. a great question. So the question is, is the closure, are the closures accelerating? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, so I don't want to say something wrong. But I think it's a great question. I, I actually would, I can go back and look it up. I, I do, I will say that before we kind of finalized the research, we looked at um, what the, mo we looked at recent closures and whether the model would have like predicted those. And we um, found a lot of coverage about some of our um, more uh, kind of unstable, <laughs> the, some of the more unstable institutions we found had been like local press had covered uh, you know, these colleges are struggling or, so we, we did find a fair amount of validation. Um, and in some cases, like they had actually closed more, you know, in the last year or so. So. Yes. Well, that's a good point. Um, these questions are fantastic. I'm, I'm just really, really enjoying this. We, we also have one more question from uh, someone who can't be here. Um, uh, but they asked, how can we strengthen these wake-up calls of uh, discussions with college and university trustees, especially the small ones and or the ones that have fewer financial resources? Mm -hmm. It may be that trustees are misinformed about these challenges and uh, just want to keep things going. Um, can, can we get these conversations uh, going better and, and pass this information to them? I think that's exactly right, because there isn't really the same sense of fiduciary responsibility that you'd have, you know, in a corporation. Um, and there aren't regulations about how much cash you need on hand. So our, notably, our report kind of said you would go out of business when like the lines crossed, but you, that doesn't include anything to teach out the, um, the students that are currently enrolled. You know, there probably should be some rule about the yeah. cash cushion or benchmark of the, you know, the amount of cash cushion that an institution has at any given time so that they can at least teach out the existing class. And um, that doesn't exist. And so I think, I think pointing to the boards and trustees is really interesting. Um, again, I'm not sure how to do that outside of a regulatory framework, but it seems like the right question to ask. Maybe, maybe simply on a consulting basis too. Yeah, but how do you, you gotta get to everyone? <laughs> More scale. I mean, that's 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 one to one. Yeah. If, if we turn Edmit into a behemoth with a thousand consultants, maybe that's the. <laughs> um, but we, we're coming up. This we are terrible for you in many ways. We're just giving you all this extra work to do, um, and and I I feel bad in part because we are at the end of the hour as well. Um, so it really did. And let, let me just say first of all. Thank you so much uh, for being so open and candid and sharing all this great work with us. I really, really appreciate that, Sabrina. Thank you to everyone for your questions and um, your nice demeanors. <laughs> <laughs> the forum is a good place. It is. Good people. Uh, well, let me ask you just one quick question. What's the best way to keep up with you and with Edmund? What's the, uh, um, uh, what's the best way to do that? Um, well, my Twitter handle is just my name, Sabrina Manville. Um, our Edmit, you can follow Edmit as well. That tends to be a little more kind of student oriented material, but um, you can look us up on LinkedIn and Twitter um, and Facebook if you'd like. And and me personally, Sabrina Manville on Twitter. Very good. And uh, if anyone wanted to email you, it was uh, sabrina at edmit.me, right? Yes. 
Oh, fantastic. And we just got a couple of comments and questions that came in. They all say, bring Edmit back soon. So you have more of that. Thank you. Thank you once more. Um, but don't go away, folks. We just have to point out for the next couple of weeks what's up. Um, let me just thank you again for these great questions. Um, it's just a real pleasure to watch the Future Transform Brain Trust at work. Um, next week, uh, we should have Mary Churchill here from the University of Venus, a long time inside higher ed commentator who does great stuff about the role of women in academia. We're really looking forward to that. Um, our Future Transform video archive has, we have not added to it for a couple of months because of uh, backlog. We're about to unleash a whole bunch of uh, new videos for that. So keep your eye on the archive. If you want to keep talking about these questions, is it ethical to release this information? How can we best inform students and families of making these kind of choices without blowing up higher education? We have great places to talk about this. We have a Slack channel. We have a LinkedIn group, a Facebook group, and of course on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. Once again, thank you all for coming. Um, it's been delightful talking with you all. Um, we'll see you online, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Bye-bye.